<laughs> Hi, Alan. So it looks like everyone's in the room now. Um, so okay. do you want to go ahead and, and, and get us started if everyone's ready? Yes, okay. Um, so welcome everybody to our uh, department's pro seminar. Um, and I, uh, uh, this is the last one of the year, which is, which is actually uh, uh, quite, uh, uh, quite a feat. We've gone through the year, it's hard to believe with COVID. So today we actually are gonna be having two fantastic speakers. Uh, the first is Professor Mary Bassett, who's the director of the FXB Center for Health and Human Rights. At, uh, H at, at the School of Public Health and is the FXB Professor of the Practice of Health and Human Rights, uh, also at the School of Public Health. She's had more than 30 years experience uh, in public health and she's dedicated her career to advancing health equity, which is really uh, very much the topic of today. Uh, prior to her directorship at the FXB Center, Dr. Bassett served for four years as Commissioner of Health for New York City. And she, you know, her work there, is huge, but I think it can be it can be summed up uh, in that she worked uh, to ensure that every New York City neighborhood supported the health of its residences, of its residents, and 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 she was she was trying to close the gaps uh, in population health and access across the city. She actually lived in Zimbabwe for 20 years between 1985 and 2002. She served on the medical faculty at the University of Zimbabwe and developed a range of HIV prevention interventions there. She served as Associate Director of Health Equity at the Rockefeller Foundation's Southern Africa office overseeing its Africa AIDS portfolio. She was also uh, the Program Director of the Africa Health Initiative and the Child Wellbeing Program at the Doris Duke Charitable uh, Foundation. She uh, has uh, um, won numerous awards, uh, the, uh, the uh, the Frank Calderon Prize in Public Health, the Lifetime Achievement, the, the uh, Kenneth Ford Lifetime Achievement Award from the, from Columbia University, the Victoria Mastro Bueno Award for Women's Health, and the National Organization for Women's Champion of Public Health Award. So we're really grateful to have uh, Professor Bassett with us today uh, to talk to us. And the respondent to Professor Bassett is is uh, Professor Jean Richardson who served uh, as the clinical lead for Partners in Health's Ebola response in Kono District in Sierra Leone, where he continues to conduct research in the social epidemiology of the Ebola virus disease. He's also worked as a clinical case management consultant for WHO's uh, Ebola Prophetic Republic of Congo. And uh, he, most recently, he was seconded to the Africa CDC to join their COVID-19 response. Uh, his new book, Epidemic Illusions, has just come out. And uh, for those of you that, that don't know Gene, he's a physician and an anthropologist. And in this book, he argues that um, public health practices from epidemic modeling to out, outbreak containment to even the way we use big data, um, that, that these public health practices play an essential role in perpetuating global in, inequities. And so Jean has drawn on post-colonial theory, medical anthropology, critical science studies to show how uh, disciplines like epidemiology and the way we conduct epidemiology have been shaped by the colonial, uh, racial, and patriarchal systems that have obtained, uh, he argues, since 1492. Uh, Jean's work is focused on biosocial approaches to understanding epidemic diseases. And part of this effort, he's chair of the Lancet Commission on Reparations and Redistributive Justice. So let's start by having Professor Bassett uh, present, and then we'll go to Jean to respond. Thank okay. you for joining us, Professor Bassett. Uh, thanks, thanks very much. And um, somebody just signaled to me, if I go on too long, I, when, you get, uh, when you're asked to speak to a class, I often just try and talk about things I've been thinking about. So um, I, I, may, uh, I may need to speed things along. I, I know this is in the global health program, is it? Um, so I thought uh, I'm gonna be talking about the domestic uh, situation and, uh, and it, it, it's really a pleasure to have the United States be considered part of the global terrain. Uh, and of course, many of the issues that have made us have the worst uh, COVID uh, epidemic of all wealthy nations 
uh, pertain elsewhere. And the, the huge uh, rise in income inequality, the precarity of labor, uh, the, uh, you know, the fact that a growing number of people, both within and between countries, simply can't protect their well being effectively has made us very vulnerable to this pandemic. And the front page of the New York Times today uh, is a story about what happened in India when it precipitously decided to close down, send migrants home. And it discusses how the railways became a vector uh, as departing migrants uh, carried COVID with them. Okay, so, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you. This is Salman again. I forgot the most important part of my intro. I was supposed to tell everyone that this is being taped. Oh. <laughs> and so if you, if you don't want to be seen on the video feed, please turn off your video. Thank you, sorry to interrupt you. No problem, ha has, but usually a mysterious voice announces that we're being yeah. recorded. I didn't hear it. I haven't it heard it either. Well, I will proceed. Um, so I'm gonna talk about uh, the racial ethnic disparities in COVID-19, which we've witnessed in the United States and how they are founded on structural racism, which reaches back across the history of the United States to its founding. And then um, talk a, a little bit about what we can do. Uh, I, I don't need to tell everybody that um, what a catastrophe the federal response has been. And I'm hopeful that we now are turning the page on that. Uh, we're in the midst of a, an epidemic in which the CDC doesn't hold reg regular briefings, uh, doesn't, hasn't proclaimed any national strategy. Uh, we had to endure an executive which not only ignored but disdained science and uh, interfered with, uh, with scientific pronouncements. And this has had a terrible impact on the already weak public health infrastructure in the United States. Uh, the US, of course, has had declining investment in public health at both federal and, and local level. And in this current atmosphere, many local and state public health leaders have left their job. My replacement in New York City resigned, stating her sadness that the public health department wasn't uh, listened to by the political leadership um, and, uh, and many others across the nation in the middle, uh, in, in, uh, in July, the Kellogg Foundation or maybe it was Kaiser Foundation reported, it was Kaiser reported that over 50, nearly 50 had left, um, some of them facing death threats over the recommendation to wear face masks. So we're in a very uh, strange environment and I feel sorry for this guy, but I'm glad he's getting to leave. Um, and into this, um, this um, gap uh, strode, uh, strode the media, particularly the print media. Journalists really have sounded the alarm and it was journalists who sounded the alarm about the emerging racial disparities um, that were recognized very early on in the US response. You remember that the first death in the United States that was reported was on February 29th. I always remember it because it was leap year. And, uh, and just in, in March, uh, before it was even recommended that we wear face masks, before people really understood or had grasped how uh, important it was to uh, take these uh, personal measures to avoid infection, uh, we were already seeing very marked um, uh, differences. And, uh, and all of this was coming from the media. Uh, I, I just, this was an early paper by actually researchers at, at Oxford. Um, and I, I don't expect you to read all these things, but the one in red is the only uh, peer reviewed article in the bunch. They're all from media and uh, independent think tank research groups. So. Um, you know, I think we have uh, really got the media to thank um, New York Times and the Washington Post in particular, uh, as they kept uh, COVID-19 in the headlines when confusion and, um, and, and uh, fragmentation reigned. Um, and, you know, this was, a they used incredible graphics I, you can see it here. I, I don't, no, you can't see it really. But this was uh, a line showing how bad the job loss was compared to others. It was on the front page of the New York Times as a full graph. Um, and of course, 
the racial disparities were highlighted by the media and they kept it in the headlines as deaths and you know this is cool this was done by harvard researchers this is showing uh the cases and deaths and uh this was the beginning nobody really understood uh what it meant to have um you know these catastrophic there's washington first cases there goes new york city out there but I, the main point that I take from this is not just the lag between deaths and cases, uh, but the fact that, the, you know, although New York City, New Jersey, the East Coast led the way, we now know very clearly that the whole pack uh, has followed the same trajectory. Uh, and um, I, we have to watch it. I don't know how to make it. We have to watch it till it ends. It's a few more seconds, I think. And so uh, there is everyone. And of course, we've now surpassed the 300,000 death mark. And maybe I can. Um, and, um, you know, um, it, it, this is catastrophic. And, uh, and Milwaukee was the first uh, jurisdiction to report excess mortality among Blacks. They had at the time only 15 deaths in the state, in the state of Wisconsin and eight in Milwaukee, the county that's Milwaukee, and all of them were among African Americans, but many others followed. And you can look at this graph and see that the um, mortality rate among whites, everybody's going up, uh, but the, these lines are not gonna, uh, they're not going to change their, their ranking uh, in terms of white, white and Asian risk. Um, and tens of thousands of lives have been lost that wouldn't have been lost if we didn't have these racial ethnic disparities and mortality rates. These are data from my old department uh, from New York City. And this is what gave me the sense that not only were uh, people of African descent dying at higher rates, they were dying at younger ages. And I don't know the people to whom I'm speaking and what your epi background is, but this they did they presented age adjusted rates. Most of the early data were the proportion of people in a given race uh, ethnic group uh, uh, who died versus their presence in the population, which is not really the right way to look at it. You should look at it by rates and you should look at it by age adjusted rates because there's obviously a risk of dying that goes with age. So this is when you look at whites in New York City, and this is this, can you see my pointer? Somebody nod, yeah. Yes. Uh, this is the uh, crude death rate. And when you adjust for age, look at how much it goes down by 30%. So that suggests that deaths in whites are occurring in older ages. You shouldn't compare, um, you, you need to try and make the age structures the same because if you're comparing an elderly population where you expect there to be more deaths to a young population, the, you don't want the difference in mortality just to reflect the age structure. So this was the first sense that um, the age structures were really different. Look, there was hardly any shift. In fact, it went up a bit with age adjustment among Latinos and it went down a little bit among African-Americans. So suggesting that these were younger populations and this was an older population that was dying. So um, we did an analysis um, to looking, and I'm only going to show you the data from February to May, but we published it uh, February through July, and I've just redone the analysis uh, going through October. And it showed that compared to whites, when you take age into account, uh, these were the, uh, the um, age-adjusted mortality rates. Um, and importantly, when you look at it by age, age-specific mortality, you see this incredibly high risk ratios. I, I want everyone to understand that this is not the kind of uh, risk ratios that we typically see. Ninefold higher is in this age group, 35 to 44 among blacks as compared to whites, uh, means a 900% higher risk of death. And, uh, and that is something that I hope uh, people will agree has to be due to, um, to uh, exposure. Um, but, uh, and uh, if you look at 
you know, this is, you know, it matters how old you are when you die. Uh, not that we want to throw our old people away who are valuable to us, uh, but dying at a young age means that you uh, have been deprived of years uh, ahead of you. And this, this is just the years that people lost before the age of 65. And I, these are absolute numbers, but here you can see nearly sevenfold higher loss of life before the age of 65 among blacks and so on. Um, and, uh, you know, this is something that I'm busy write, trying to write an op-ed about uh, because uh, it's important to keep in mind that we, the people, when you have different life expectancies that deaths are occurring at younger ages. So that among the white population, nearly 90% of people who died of COVID um, have, and this is, these are more recent data through October, uh, died before, uh, after the age of, of 65. And in contrast, among American Indians, uh, nearly 60% uh, nearly uh, died after the age of 65. So that if we imagine that a vaccine were being made available to everybody after the age of 65, uh, among the deaths that have occurred in whites, all but a, about 10% would have been vaccine eligible on the basis of age. And 43% and, and of the people who did die of COVID would not have been vaccine eligible. They might be eligible for other reasons, comorbid conditions, the kind of jobs they do, uh, but they wouldn't be eligible based on age. And so uh, we know that there is much higher um, uh, risk of death among younger people. Um, and that has held up uh, throughout the pandemic. And they emerge really early, which suggests to me that, um, that it's structural in origin. Nobody knew how to change their personal behavior back in March, really, on a population basis. And, and uh, although it uh, was first identified in cities, an analysis by the New York Times showed that we see these racial disparities across the United States in rural areas and suburban areas and in cities. So um, how do people explain this? Well, the usual go-to explanations. One, the, the sick pathologized black body, the, you know, they're so sick and now they're sicker. Uh, said by the, you know Tony Fauci, which I really do, uh, you know, we all have enormous regard for him, but he was saying this is hopeless. We can't really do anything about it. They're already so sick and now they're dying faster. And then came the uh, Surgeon General, um, you know, who, um, uh, you know, said it's, you know, because of reckless behavior. So those are the two types of explanations, both of which um, make the problem reside in the individual. And I just want to note uh, what Ibram Kendi, who has famously wrote the book on how to be an anti-racist, pointed out that this is kind of the litmus test for an explanation that we should ask ourselves, is this racist? When the problem is located in the individual and not uh, in the context in which they are uh, conducting their lives, we should in interrogate that explanation as a racist idea because a ninefold higher risk of death, uh, and it was higher across all age categories, um, uh, as you can see by quickly scanning, and in all groups that are not classified as whites, uh, was out of proportion to anything we understand about excess mortality related to comorbid conditions or indeed premature mortality, which is about 50% higher among um, black Americans as compared to whites. And uh, so, you know, you can't explain with these conditions why we're getting up to ninefold higher. And this is a paper that was done by uh, I don't know how to pronounce his name. Bill Hannigy is how I would pronounce it, but I, I don't think he pronounces it like that with Nancy Krieger. And this is just showing age-specific mortality rates but over time. And what you can see here, these are African-Americans and you can see it's splaying more. And, but when we get to August, um, African Americans, and I can't see my own screen here, have been, whoops, sorry, um, have uh, been overtaken by Latinos. 
this pink line is uh, is the Latinx population, and there's been a really worrying escalation in mortality relative to other groups in this population, um, which uh, you know is almost certainly explained by the precarity of an Im immigrant population in terms of housing, healthcare access, and jobs. And so uh, just to say that these are differences that are not related to any inherent biological differences by race, ethnicity, and they're due to what we call structural racism. And so I'm now going to talk about uh, and this is the main focus of my work, including when I was at the health department, is this idea of structural racism. And, uh, and actually, uh, although it's embargoed until um, 5 p.m. today uh, with two um, younger two younger scholars, I uh, we have a piece coming out in the New England Journal called "How Structural Racism Works." So uh, I'll send it along to somebody in case anybody's interested in it. But this is back 400 years. This is an homage to the piece, the, the special issue of the New York Times Magazine section uh, in recognizing 400 years that came out in um, over the summer of 2019. And just so you remember, uh, about um, 12 and a half million Africans were taken out of Africa. Uh, just look at this. This is always amazing to me. And if you want to spend a lot of time looking to, at the learning about the maps of the transatlantic slave trade, I can recommend this book, The Atlas of the Transatlantic Slave Trade. But the US received a uh, directly relatively minor share of the, um, of the transport of human beings from Africa. Most went to Brazil um, and to the, to the Caribbean. Some then moved from those places to the US, but the US black population was mostly grown naturally as Jefferson um, pointed out. It's such a wonderful product. You know, they, they grow. Um, and you buy you buy one, and then you get more. Uh, so uh, the structural racism is really um, uh, refers to the many almost silent ways in which racism works in our society, without the intention even of individuals. Uh, it uh, has been um, it, it has been continuous and. This is um, the taxonomy that we proposed at the health department um, center to the concept of racism as a concept of power and resources, um, principally uh, economic resources. And um, this is how I think about it, that structural racism is a platform uh, for which, under, which allows other forms of racism to work including internalized racism, which I'll talk about, interpersonal, which is mostly what people think about, and institutional, uh, which has also taken a, um, a um, uh, you know, has, uh, that was con coined by Stokely Carmichael. Uh, so that uh, idea has been around for 40 years. And I consider these antecedent. This is antecedent to the social determinants of health. And uh, all, all of the social determinants of health in the United States and really around the world, the whole colonial world also uh, was subjected to the impact of white supremacy as an ideology. Uh, and so there's a racial gradient in just about anything you can think about regarding resources for health. I'm going to keep going kind of quickly through this. Uh, the internalized racism, uh, if you want to see a really wrenching example of it, um, this is from a, a study that was um, part of the Brown versus the Board of Education court case in which a child, a black ch children were asked to identify the good doll, the pretty doll, the smart doll, and nearly all of them picked the white doll. And a high school student repeated this in New York City uh, in the night, late 1980s. You can Google it and find it. And she found the exact same thing. Um, and it's really heart-wrenching to watch. Uh, so this is the ways in which the uh, uh, marginalized and oppressed population um, absorbs the concepts of inferiority that are in the dominant culture. And interpersonal racism is where um, 
uh, where we spend most of our time. This is where the implicit bias uh, ideas, um, you know, um, are, are, uh, uh, would be categorized. Institutional racism uh, occurs within uh, a single institution. It explains why all of us sitting here today look the way we do and our student population, our faculty. Um, and um, it, it, I'm rushing to get to structural racism because here I'm gonna just take a moment and uh, read out the definition that we offered that it, structural racism involves interconnected institutions whose linkages are historically rooted, culturally reinforced, and refers to the totality of ways in which societies foster racial discrimination through mutually reinforcing and equitable systems that in turn reinforce discriminatory beliefs, values, and distribution of resources, which together affect the risk of health outcomes. Um, so uh, it is, you know, uh, it's sometimes referred to as the invisible form of racism and uh, the explanation um, and it, um, it's important though that we acknowledge that, it be, that it's actual. This is not a concept like the miasma theory of disease. It's just sort of in the air. It works through concrete pathways that we can describe, some of which are listed here. Um, and uh, um, so I, I just wanna reiterate that although it's pervasive, it is not, uh, un, it is not uh, resistant to understanding. And, um, and it works, well, in many complex ways, uh, but it's fundamentally rooted to the, um, to the distribution of resources. And this is an example of structural racism that I often use, redlining. Uh, this is from maps from New York, uh, I, um, but there are same similar maps from Boston. These maps were driven, were drawn at the request of government um, when they came up with the federal um, um, uh, sponsored mortgage program, uh, which was really designed to increase home ownership after the depression. It used to be you had to like save half the purchase price of a house in order to buy a house. And then that shifted to 10%, uh, which it was uh, until you know the economic, the 2008, uh, when it's now more standardly 20%. Uh, so these are neighborhoods, and in Boston, you would recognize them. This is East and Central Harlem, um, neighborhoods that we know to, of today as, um, as uh, segregated neighborhoods. Uh, our cities are highly segregated. New York City is highly segregated, much more segregated than Boston, actually. Um, New York is always in the top five of the most segregated cities in the United States. And in many ways, um, uh, the redlining um, uh, further contributed uh, to the absence of resources, which began with the with the uh, freeing of enslaved people with nothing, not even clothes on their back. Um, but um, home ownership is um, probably uh, the single most important uh, part of. Uh, um, intergenerational wealth transfer and the lack of access to mortgages uh, deprived African American communities of access to home ownership, exposed them to predatory mortgage practices, and uh, contributes to the huge wealth gap that um, is documented in the United States. Uh, I don't know whether I put this in, I did. Um, the, in Boston, a study done by the Federal Reserve Bank showed that the wealth gap this wealth gap. When they published it in the Boston Globe, they asked if it was a, readers responded by thinking it was a typo. And in fact, I've read the report. Um, it would not even have been $8. This is assets minus debts. Uh, if it weren't for the immigrant Caribbean population in Boston, which did achieve some levels of home ownership, your, your classic triple deckers. So uh, this graphic I like because it shows the arc of history and how little of it for African-Americans um, you know, was in the green 
this is the period in which African Americans were enslaved. Uh, that was rapidly followed by, um, uh, you know, measures that amounted to verging on re-enslavement. And this artist dated it to the Brown versus Board of Education. Others date it to 64, 10 years later. And, um, uh, and this, um, uh, which um, was when the Civil Rights Act passed, that's when Reagan, uh, uh, and then it was followed by uh, in 1980, when we really saw an escalation in the war on drugs. I, I don't know why I put I had somebody modify this for me and I'm not quite sure why Reagan is there. Reagan wasn't there yet. Uh, but in many ways, um, the, um, you know, the uh, Civil Rights Act sort of um, repartitioned the US electorate. I'm sure you're all aware that in 1964 was the last time that majority of whites who voted, voted for the Democratic Party. So Janssen famously said that we've lost the South for a generation. Uh, but it's been more than that. Um, so, uh, you know, the, uh, I think that since the events of the summer um, and the killing, uh, the extrajudicial killing of George Floyd, um, many of us have become more familiar with the actual history of the United States, um, which is what we should all be doing. Um, we, we all need to read more history. Uh, but it's for people of African descent, um, you know, quite a gloomy story. I mean, I'm a, uh, I'm a product of the civil rights movement uh, in the year that uh, people, I went to Radcliffe as an undergraduate. There were 36 black students in my entering class. And the year of people who were graduating, there had been 12. So Harvard always had some, uh, but um, we, there was a huge opening up. Uh, which, um, you know, was a direct effect of the civil rights movement. Um, but we've seen some gloomy times since then um, with, uh, you know, uh, if you look here in the bottom right, uh, beginning with Nixon, the war on drugs, and then uh, the war on crime, um, the unleashed, um, uh, the whole process of mass incarceration, uh, additionally, the emergence of a police surveillance state um, and the, as we've witnessed, and uh, many people can now name their names, um, the, um, the phenomenon of, uh, of police killings. Well, I mean, the U.S. police force uh, nationally is much more lethal than in any other wealthy country, uh, but disproportionate numbers of Blacks, particularly Black men, but also Black women, um, have died as a result of police encounters. So um, I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna sort of wind up here, I think, and hope that we have some time for a discussion. Um, as uh, Jean will probably will talk about um, the the gap uh, the the wealth gap is insurmountable, and it uh, it it has absolutely. Um, has to do with um, the health gap that we see. Uh, in order to guarantee yourself uh, the resources needed for health, um, you have to have wealth. And, um, and, and this has given rise to the concept of reparations. Um, it's been, gosh, nearly 20 years ago since the Durban meeting on racism, uh, which the United States walked out of and the, with Israel. Um, uh, but at that meeting, the concept of reparations was raised. The Caribbean, uh, in, the English speaking um, Caribbean, the West Indies, uh, really embraced reparations as a, as a state project. They are, their governments, uh, CARICOM, are pursuing reparations. Uh, but in the United States, I'd say that it really gained national attention with the publication of uh, Tennessee Coates in the Atlantic in 2014. Uh, but Sandy Darity, uh, who's pictured with his wife, Kirsten here, have written a, a book that I recommend to everyone from here to equality. Um, and um, he uh, makes a case uh, for reparations 
uh, that are hinged on the elimination of the wealth gap, uh, which um, I gave you that astounding Boston number, but basically on average, every African-American household makes $800,000, has $800,000 less in assets. The uh, cost of reparations will go into the trillions. Uh, and, uh, but he, they point out that it's, there, it's not as though there's no um, um, precedent for reparations. Um, there is uh, reparations inadequate, probably were given to people of Japanese descent who were uh, placed in basically concentration camps during World War II. Uh, reparations were paid to the families of people who died in the attacks on the World Trade Center, which was, they, these were non-state actors. Um, and uh, of course, um, so they argue that it's a state responsibility, the state, uh, all, the, all of the, the horrible history um, that, uh, uh, that about uh, um, the use of violence against the African descended population in the United States was legal. Pretty much all of it was entirely legal. And so that means that government has a responsibility um, so they make a compelling case and that we, um, and I with Sandra Galea wrote a piece, short piece in the New England Journal arguing that we, if we're serious about overcoming the black white health gap in the United States, which has existed every single year that data have existed even before the nation um, was a nation, even in the colonial period, um, you know, we've had a long time to try and overcome this. The explanation remains that people are either culturally inferior, genetically inferior, or ignorant and stubborn. Um, but, um, but so we need to do this in order to ensure that everyone, uh, that we can eliminate this. I um, was, gave a talk uh, to some students at Al Albany Medical College and they showed me this. It's a mural on one of the boarded up, uh, you know, buildings closed down because of COVID, uh, you know, some of them boarded up their windows. And this is a quote from Angela Davis. I'm no longer accepting the things uh, I cannot change. I'm changing the things I cannot accept. And this even appeared on a billboard on, the, on a big station in New York City. Um, so I'm uh, very hopeful that we, I mean, it's winter, people aren't in the street anymore, uh, but we've seen a more massive response to the um, lethal effects of the US racial, racial hierarchy than I've seen in 50 years. So I'm feeling very hopeful about it. Okay, I'm very gonna stop there. Mary, thank you so much for such a fantastic uh, presentation. So Jean, uh, maybe you- I'm gonna could... stop sharing. Is that a good idea? Yes, please. Okay. Again, some slides too. I don't know how to, how to do this. I'm gonna turn them. Am I still here? You're still there and you're no longer sharing. So it's perfect. Ah, cool. And. Congratulations, Paul. <laughs> okay, Gene, you're on mute though. Okay, perfect. All right. Thanks so much, Mary. It, it's an honor to follow you. You know, you've been a hero of mine since back in your Zim days when I was living in South Africa. So uh, it's always a pleasure to join forces. Um, so I'm just gonna follow on with the, um, reparations part, but before that, I just wanted to say a word about our chair, who I saw this morning was awarded the Bear Gruen Prize for $1 million, um, wow. so richly deserved. It's actually, a, it was a philosophy prize, so it's great to honor ideas that actually have more uh, impact than just, you know, being uh, on, the, on the dusty shelf. All right, so uh, to add a bit more from Ibram Kendi, I just wanted to put his definitions for race 
um, which it, he says is a power construct of collected or merged difference that lives socially. And therefore, a, a racist policy is any measure that produces or sustains racial inequity between racial groups. Um, for me, sustains is, is an important word here. Uh, an anti-racist policy is any measure that pr uh, produces or sustains racial equity between racial groups. Uh, and more on that in a bit. Um, Mary described the racial and ethnic disparities in uh, population COVID mortality. Uh, this is from a, a paper that you know, shows the same thing here around you know, 3.75 relative risk, which again, our, our hero, uh, you know, Tony Fauci who's done good work, um, you know, fell into the position that it was you know, black fragility that was re responsible for this, but you know we're really seeing that it's actually exposure, that um, the structured risk for getting infected is why we're seeing these higher rates. And so, um, you know, structural interventions therefore have a role to play. So, you know, following on the the four hundred years of history that Mary described, from uh, slavery to Jim Crow to lethal policing. Um, you know, what I examine in, in my work is um, how does social science contribute to, uh, to racial hierarchies? So if structural racism, as Mary said, is the totality of ways uh, that uh, racial domination is fostered. Uh, I look at the ways how it's fostered in, the, um, in how we describe phenomena and, and how we exert what we call social science. And so Today, I was going to use the example of IHME, which is the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation at, um, at the University of Washington. And there's a recent article in The Nation, which is pretty good. It goes in to uh, show how you know, um, you know, this, this foundation has received over $600 million, to, which is a lot for an academic institute, uh, to do the counting of the world's bur you know, uh, disease burdens. And, um, you know, is there, is racist work done in the way they count? And um, my response is yes. So first, if we look at their COVID forecasts, um, you know, there's a, there's a paper by Marchin and all that shows that the true number of next day deaths fell outside IHME's prediction intervals, like fell outside their 95% confidence intervals 70% of the time. So one, their forecasts are wrong. Uh, two, their plunging projections were used to endorse the Trump's administration's COVID-19 response as competent and effective. So two, the one in the wrong, two, they serve ideological purposes. Three, though, these forecasts endorse a future where COVID-19 disparities continue to exist. So all they say is that, you know, we have this many infections now. If you wear masks and social distance, we'll have this many uh, we'll have this many infections in the future. But those curves, the disparities continue as Mary was showing. They don't, you know, there, there's nothing in these ways of interpreting health phenomena that, uh, that brings the disparities together, that creates some kind of equity. So therefore, according to the Ibram Kendi definitions we talked about earlier, they're racist, right? They do not, they contribute to sustaining uh, disparities. You know, if your goal as a public health institute or a public health person is to improve the health of populations, yet you put out work that endorses continued disparities, then by Kendi's definition, you're racist. And in short, I think that they actively delimit through their exaggerated precision and their acceptance of government interventions as status quo, the public's ability to imagine social alternatives. And what might be those? social alternatives. Mary started talking about it at the end. Um, and together, um, she's on a, a Lancet Commission with us, Paul and Salman are on it, um, on reparations and redistributive justice. And Mary is a, our medical and health advisor, but we're divided into 10 sections uh, that look at uh, the evidence for reparations claims and recommendations for those claims for different um, geopolitical entities like you know, Congo 
um, and uh, legacies of King Leopold Belgium and then the US um, apartheid in South Africa, the caste system in India, um, slavery in the, um, in the uh, Caribbean and descendants of slaves in the US. I see Joe's on, Joe's on the commission working on historical trauma with the Native Americans. We also have climate justice and, um, and uh, victims of sexual, uh, sexual violence in, in war. Um, the one I'd like to focus on is, follows from uh, the, the, I think the racist work that we see essentially uh, groups like IHME doing. And so what are reparations real quick, uh, just to um, uh, agree with what Mary said, it's an acknowledgement of a grievous injustice, it's redress for the injustice and it's closure of the grievances held by the group subjected to the injustice. And that's from Darity and Mullen's book. So how would we change such forecasting and modeling to be anti-racist? Um, in the US, as we saw uh, as of yesterday, over 16 million reported cases, which is, uh, you know, is still probably five times an undercount. Um, and we've gotten over 300,000 deaths. Um, in the project I'm going to show, we, we did some modeling of what reparations would have looked like for the outbreak in uh, Louisiana, uh, which itself has reported 272,000 um, cases and nearly 7,000 deaths. Um, and so this is something I presented, uh, Megan saw this at uh, the GHAC, but we have a paper right now, we, uh, Mary and um, Sandy Darity and Kirsten Mullen um, and some other colleagues, which has been, <laughs> it's, at, it's at its eighth journal now, uh, but it's been resubmitted and I, th I think we're going to get this one published, but it's really shown me, I think all of us, how um, just based on the reviewer comments that what we, you know, it wasn't that what the mathematical modeling we were doing was suspect. It was that our assumptions were so huge. Uh, how could you, how could we possibly assume that uh, decreasing the wealth gap from $800,000 to equity might put black populations in a position where they could, um, you know, social distance better, have less precarious housing, not have to do frontline as much. Like how is, how is that, uh, uh, an extraordinary assumption, but that's basically what we got back as feedback. And so it showed, um, you know, uh, what we talked about earlier, this racism is universal. It's in, you know, funding for research. It's in reviews for, uh, for academic papers. Uh, it's in the models we do to, to forecast outbreaks. So what we did is, and, and I can send you the paper if you want. Um, we considered some uh, range of reproductive ratios to cal back calculate transmission rates for um, four cells of a simplified next generation matrix um, to look at R naught uh, for structured models in Louisiana. And we modeled the effect that monetary payments as reparations would have had on, um, you know, early in the outbreak. And here's what it looks like. I can send you the, um, uh, the paper if you're, if you're interested. But we found that uh, Louisiana is overcrowded uh, by housing. So you can see the black population has more people uh, living per room um, than uh, the white population. And uh, empiric studies coming out now are basically saying that this huge difference we see in exposure likely comes from the household and from work. So here we have the evidence of you know, uh, overcrowded housing, um, but there's also evidence that um, uh, people of color uh, take up frontline work uh, in, in higher proportions. And here's the, the, the simple uh, uh, result that Louisiana, you know, we could calculate a, um, uh, an R naught in the range of four ish when, uh, you know, uh, black populations are left without a reparative program because um, transmission dynamics are often driven by the highest risk group. So if you have a high risk group that has the equivalent of a you know, subgroup R naught, which doesn't really exist, but for, all, for philosophical purposes, let's say it does, um, that drives the whole population's uh, R naught. If through reparations, you were able to reduce just that, the high risk transmission, you would reduce the R naught for the population as a whole. So you're benefiting the 
entire population as far as transmission dynamics, uh, not just the group that received um, um, the, the reparative uh, program or the redistributive justice. So it comes down to, you know, here's our area around two-ish. What are the mechanisms by which a reparative program might have reduced, uh, you know, uh, COVID transmission? So it's there's a narrowing of the path dependent racial wealth divide. Um, which then leads to changes in the built environment, fostering the ability to social distance. Frontline work would be spread out across racial groups, and then a de decreased race-based allostatic load. And we conclude that uh, since reparations have not been enacted, you know, the reopening of American society, which happened over the summer, um, had a di disproportionate adverse incidence and therefore mortality effect on Black people. And this was predictable. We wrote this back in April and predicted this. Um, and so the appalling evidence of racism embodied in this uh, disproportionate COVID incidence, as Mary described so well, um, should add to the moral, historical, and legal arguments, as if those weren't enough. Uh, you know, but here we show that in addition to those arguments, there's actually uh, you know, uh, pandemic containment reasons why repairing uh, past injustice through ameliorating the wealth gap uh, would be um, salubrious for the nation at large. So thanks for that. We now have, uh, looks like about a half hour for discussion. Um, if you wanted to email me or uh, message me on Twitter um, for any other questions outside of it, feel free to, but I'm gonna turn this off so we can discuss together. Thank you. Thank you, Jean, and thank you, Mary, for such a great, um, Great presentation. So let's open it up. Any uh, any questions or thoughts or reflections from people? Can I just make a comment on? Um, I, I just want to um, say that uh, Jean has highlighted how out outlandish the concept of reparations really seems to people. They and um, and and that it remains true. But we have seen progress in the past couple of years that suggests that there's been a shifting of attitudes um, somewhat. I mean, not the, the um, uh, Sandy Darity and um, I've become sort of a groupie of Sandy Darity. I've watched all these YouTubes of him and he says in one of them that he long felt this was just a waste of time because it was so unachievable, not because it wouldn't be morally and uh, correct. Uh, but uh, he cites a, a, a recent poll uh, that shows that the proportion of white respondents who said that they thought reparations was a good idea went from 23% a couple of years ago to 37% pre, uh, uh, presently. And back in 2000, it was, you know, uh, down closer to seven, you know, to under 10%. So there has been a growing recognition um, that, a, um, that a reckoning is required um, in order to, you know, to have our nation as a whole go forward. Uh, so it's not all hopeless, but it certainly is true that um, that the reviewers of uh, the paper that Jean was talking about um, consider it not worth um, exploring. And so it has an, it's an idea that has made it further in the population than it has in the academy at the moment. So I'll add to that, that um, you know, Mary's paper in the New England Journal has helped push it in the clinical world. So I'd recommend that to you. It's a recent on uh, reparations as a uh, public health priority. Um, so Mary and Jean, just to, you know, just to start us off on the questions, I, um, I realize people think that the money seems like a lot, but if you look at the, you know, the bailout that took place in 2008, the, the minimum amount that people see the bailout as was 700 billion, some see it over, you know, well over a trillion. The argument of why it made sense was that it, it went back into the economy. People actually used the money People often forget that, um, even with the same, stimulus now, 
that people don't put it under their mattress, they spend it because they need to spend it and it enables, the, you know, it goes into the economy to retail, rent. We've even seen it with the, uh, you know, the COVID stimuli, right? Mm -hmm. There, those trillions are there. I think that the current tab for the wealth gap is something around 12 trillion. So, you know, that's 12 years of, of COVID, uh, um, right, they don't propose it be paid at one go. Right. So, so Mary and Jean, I've talked to each of you about this extensively and separately. <laughs> what, what do you guys think about the fact that you, this is clearly important? You guys are showing this wealth gap, which is huge. It is not the only gap. And I guess the question I have is, how does this relate to and how will we address the institutional racism. Like, let's say we gave $10 trillion in reparations. Can a black young man still go down the street without getting shot in the back? No. Can you still not be treated badly when and searched 50 times when you walk into an airport? Like, does the institutional racism, the, the doll experiment that you just did, does that change with the reparations or are reparations one step and we have so much else to do? And if the answer is yes, we have so much else to do, what do we need to do in addition to these reparations? Do you want to, I, I, mean, I, think, I think you ask a really good question. And, and, and beyond that, obviously, there will always be a difference between having grown up with wealth and having a windfall, or as, as some people would see, reparations. Uh, so that the, you know, that simply reducing the wealth gap won't overcome the centuries of of discrimination and terror um, that um, that has you know accompanied the end of le legal enslavement in the United States. Uh, so, um, so it's not going to be enough. But I sure think it would make a big difference. And that when people have resources, they're able to you know they're they're able to command. Uh, you know, better lives uh, for themselves, for their children, uh, but it won't get rid of racism, uh, which, uh, you know, is something that, you know, that we have to tackle. I just don't, uh, some people argue, let's have, a, you know, like a scholarship fund. The real problem with uh, the wealth gap is the educational attainment gap. So let's like do something about that. And that I would argue against, um, because it just is not recognizing that every single family, regardless of their current social standing and economic position, has paid a price uh, for the penalty associated with race in the United States. Um, uh, other people, I, I'm a, I serve as an advisor to the Poor People's Campaign, which is sort of like, um, it's led by William Barber, um, who began with something called Moral Mondays, and it's an homage to and a continuation of uh, Martin Luther King's evolution from thinking about racial discrimination to thinking about poverty as the central challenge to justice in the United States. And they are not interested in talking about reparations, interestingly, uh, because they feel that it introduces a racial division um, which you know overlooks the fact that everyone is exploited regardless of race, um, and that every poor person is, um, you know, is paying a price for inequality, uh, regardless of race. So I, I think that there's some interesting <laughs> debates here. I personally feel that um, that the racial divide in the United States requires direct attention. It won't be solved without direct attention. And that's because of the foundational role of the use of enslaved labor uh, to US democracy. Yeah, and from here to equality, Gary and Mullen talk about how, right, it doesn't, the reparations do not end the, you know, the social force of it. Uh, but, you know, money, accru you know, political power accrues with money. Uh, you're able to represent yourself with the uh, lawyers better. They go into these mechanisms where that amount of wealth affords you the, the, uh, to be in a better position to overcome the, the social forces. But you're right, that still also takes changes in consciousness and, and, and whatnot, which um, 
you know, this is, would be seen as the catalyst for. So a couple of questions have come in. Uh, Dr. Weiss says, Mary Bassett's map of the slave trade indicates how per pervasive it was throughout the Americas. Questions about other forms of racism, like casteism, also abound throughout the world. How does traction for reparations in other parts of the world compare with the United States? Um, yeah, that's an interesting dynamic. Um, you know, the people, people often cite, some say as successful, um, the, the reparations paid from Germany to Israel for uh, families that died in the Holocaust. Um, and there's evidence that that was used to build infrastructure in a young Israeli nation. Then people would also say, but it also empowered um, settler colonialism. So is that a um, is that a successful form of reparations? Uh, elsewhere, you know the the dynamic with the Caribbean and the American reparations claims is interesting because they really are put in a position to be divided um, when the Caribbean claims are to the UK uh, and the American claims are to the US government, even though there was a lot of back and forth. And so we almost get it that when they do come about there, I think there's gonna be a very prickly um, identity politics where people are forced to show, you know, that they are a direct descendant or they were more Caribbean based. Um, and so, yeah, when you get when you get into the, the actual movements, there is some uh, thorniness. Um, elsewhere, the, for instance, I, I find Belgium one of the least likely places to uh, accept, you know, just because of what the uh, environment looked like there as far as what went on in Congo. But just this year with, with their uh, Black Lives Movement and one of the princesses, Esmeralda said she supports, you know, uh, is it Esmeralda? Um, Emer yeah, Esmeralda said that she uh, supports reparations. So there is- This is for the conda, probably. Uh, yeah. So th this year there, again, the, that 7% to 23%, I think is reflected in uh, globally or you know, more interest in, in discussing it is, is, is happening. And, and the, um, uh, the Lancet Commission looks at reparations across a range of, of, of issues, um, not, in, including bad policies, uh, not only uh, um, aimed at specific populations, but the Dalits, uh, the formerly called um, untouchables, um, uh, you know, the, uh, there's some uh, people on the commission who are making a case for Dalits. Uh, at FXB, there's been a, stand, a long-standing program on the Roma people who are really the group that is um, subject to the most um, uh, racial discrimination of, this is a population that's lived in Europe for a thousand years um, or so. Um, and um, they are, you know, they've been discriminated against uh, throughout that period. Uh, and up to the current day, it's really embedded in the culture. Many people who you would be surprised to hear how disdainful they are about the Roma, uh, who are kind of characterized as vermin. Um, so um, that they're also making a case. Uh, but the the successful case, the probably the preeminent successful case has been um, for not the Nazi atrocities. Um, and an argument is often made that this is too long ago. You know, history is full of winners and losers. Let's you know uh, just just close the door and move forward. Uh, but I think the history of this country shows that there is no moving forward. Um, in some cases, the racial gaps in the United States have grown, the relative gaps. So um, I, I read the book Cast. I don't know if the questioner was asking about that. Um, uh, but there was an argument made um, by Isabel Wilkerson, who wrote a really elegiac uh, book, first book called The Warmth of Other Sons about the great migration out of the South. Um, 
and uh, she makes the case that uh, that the right way to think about the United States is as a racial caste society, and uh, that racism inadequately captures uh, the in enduring nature of uh, of uh, of an embeddedness of racial groups. She said in the book, for example, that this explains why uh, we don't see cross-class solidarity and we, you know, interclass solidarity across race in the United States. And so Mary, the next, the next question might actually link very well with what you're talking about. Do you want to ask your question, Giran Chuti, or do you want me to read it? I see you're on. Yeah. Uh... Thank you, thank you very much for, for the presentation. Um, just as you were speaking, I was just thinking that probably the issue of reparation uh, is mainly based in the understanding of the self and humanity in, in general. And so my question was um, whether they have been um, any kind of research which shows that there have been a shift from uh, where white people now do consider non-white equally human. Because if there is no such level of equality, then I would believe that the whole concept of reparation will have no meaning uh, at all. So uh, th that was my thinking, thank you. So you're, you're, if if may I ask you a couple of questions? You're you're saying that the idea of reparations um, would only be acceptable if people agree that um, that that the differences that we see by these racial ethnic classifications is not natural. In other words, um, yep. yeah. Uh, in other words, that this reflects innate inferiority of some groups and innate superiority of others. Well, I hope that we've overcome that argument, uh, but it keeps coming back. And by innate, I mean genetic. Um, and I, you know, I, 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 I think people often say, and, and probably neither Jean nor I thought to say it to this group, that the differences by race, ethnicity are not genetic in origin. They're socially constructed and related to people's social experience and not their biology. So that the reason that each of us could probably declare uh, what race we are says more about our society uh, than it does about our biology. Uh, so, that is, uh, you know, that, that I hope uh, has been overcome. What it's been replaced by often is a notion of cultural inferiority, social inferiority, that, you know, that these are cultures that don't value school or education are slothful. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, but uh, I hope that nobody thinks that, that, that race has, is a valid, um, Biologic construct, but I, I had a I had a um, an argument with uh, in well not in person, but there's somebody at Harvard who does Reich I think his name is he does he wrote a, a big op-ed in the New York Times probably four or five years ago saying that we need to overcome all this political correctness and acknowledge that race is real, and it is real, <laughs> but it's not biological. Yeah, well put, well put. So, uh, Jean, did you want to add to that, or you, you're okay? So, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know how to prove that to people um, who are having, you know, we, we're, we've just seen a, really a fanning of the flames of white supremacy in the past four years uh, by the president. Indeed. Um, so we have another question from Vikram Patel, which is, what is your opinion on the kind of affirmative policies in education and public em employment as used in India? I don't know. He should tell us what they are. I support affirmative action, but it hasn't been particularly successful in the United States. The main beneficiaries have been white women. 
Yeah, the group that's working on that section in our commission is led by Sukadeo Torat, who I guess founded the Institute for Dalit Studies. And, it, you know, they hold that, that although these, the, the appropriate changes were made, um, you know, back in the 50s, that these, that today, that they're not manifest in, in equity. And so, um, so I don't know any more than, it, than that, but I know that our group doesn't think that the, that the current policies are, uh, you know, they could be there, like our civil rights, you know, policy. It's there in, in print, but the actual effect of it is not felt as far as uh, equity. Yeah. Vikram, I don't know if you've got a good enough connection, but uh, do you want to expand on that a bit if you're, if you're able? Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Ah, well, no, I just want to say first of all, thank you, Mary and Eugene. That was just a terrific presentation. Uh, so the question I had was simply about the same debates that you, you alluded to, Eugene. Affirmative action is about government mandated reservation in education and employment for people from the backward caste. And it's been around for decades. Um, and it's been seen as not quite the same thing as reparation in the broad sense that you described, but as one way to, uh, to have a socially mandated uh, uh, you know, system to uh, to reduce inequities by making access to education and employment, both of which are seen as ways of reducing the wealth gap, uh, be realized. So, what would be interesting for the commission to look at your commission? I, I I don't know what the what the impact has been is how much have inequities changed as a consequence of those sorts of affirmative, affirmative actions, particularly amongst those who benefited from them, because clearly not everyone has access to those jobs and educational positions since it's only a fraction of the population that can, uh, can, can get to them. But that is just a question. I don't know what the answer to that is, but it's a, it seems to be a more tractable and a more short-term policy than, you know, for example, cash transfers. Actually, I, that was a question I had. What yeah. does that look like in practical terms when you say you reduce the wealth gap by, um, you know, in, in this large amount, what kind of mechanism can a state employ to do that? Is it direct cash transfers? Is it some other kind of indirect uh, cash uh, transfer? I wondered what, if you could expand on that. Sure, I think it's Salman can talk about too, you know, he has a, a good analysis in Canada of, you know, where he talks about, um, you know, there's affirmative action for higher level education for, um, you know, native uh, peoples there, but, you know, if you can't get there, if you if if already the resources limit you from even getting to a place where you can exercise that um, you know preferential choice, then you know then it then it falls flat. As far as the reparations, you know, they different sections that we've been working with have different um, have different approaches. I think, like for instance, the South Africa one may take a similar land reform approach that Zimbabwe did, and um, you know, taking land from uh, the white farmers and conglomerates, and and you know, putting it back out to to people without land. In the U.S., I think Sandy and and Kirsten they started out with the ideas of you know the uh, like a baby grant, where you put a bunch of money in for uh, kids that are born. Um, or, um, you know, uh, free higher education and all that. But it, it seems like they've come around finally to just a check. Um, one, because of it's just more efficient and easier to um, get closure after, but uh, it, it, would, it would essentially amount to an unconditional cash transfer, at least as far as the, uh, their model um, and the one we model in the, in the, um, the paper that I presented. Right. Right. I mean, there's a bill that had its first hearing in a decade. It's been around since I think it was first proposed in 19, late 1980s called H.R. 40. The 40 um, is a reference to 40 acres and a mule, which was promised but not delivered um, at the emancipation. Um, and, and it's to study how this would be done. So I, I don't I think that um, that Sandy and Kirsten feel very strongly that there have to be individual payments uh, as part of it. Um, but there are other ways that it, it could be achieved, but certainly scholarship programs um, uh, would not be enough. There could be, um, you know, there could be certain collective actions that would be taken. 
uh, for example, creating uh, a way to subsidize mortgage costs for it or something like that, but um, that a big part of it has to be payment to individuals. And I, if I could just ramble on a bit more, in, in New York, there was an effort called uh, participatory budgeting, a strategy that was used in Latin America, where a certain chunk of funds uh, made available to a jurisdiction are decided on at, in a, a way where um, with what they did at least in New York was that they opened up a community hall and by district by district, um, uh, they would, they would, people would put forward their ideas of how the money should be spent. Uh, and then the community would literally vote on it. There'd be, uh, and the ones that got the highest number of votes would be funded. So I looked at the types of things that people were voting to fund. And, you know, I, I think there's this a sense that people would like blow the money and, uh, you know, hire a bus to go to Atlantic City to gamble for a weekend or do something like that. They spend it on computers for the library, equipment for the parks, on, you know, on stuff that had both a collective benefit and, uh, and were absolutely, um, uh, you know, ways in which I, I think most of us would want to see the money spent. So this concept that people would just fritter away their money is, um, is it, you know, it, it is based on presumptions that may not be accurate. Mary, just something more insidious than that. You know, since you, you, you presented the Boston data, you know, showing that huge gap, mm. presumably part of the gap is due to the amount of debt so yeah. would, would this money not just go back to credit card companies and banks and really be a transfer of wealth to big banks rather than the themselves? Yeah, that's a good point. I, I'd have to look at the data again, but that, that, that is in fact um, uh, mostly credit card debt. Um, yeah, uh, that, that uh, I mean, but it's also a lack of income. Um, but um, so they're both, there's both too much debt and too, too few assets. Um, so, but that would be, you know, that would definitely be something to talk about. Yeah. How to protect yeah. it at least from that, because it really it would be a shame if this became a yeah. bailout, but a bonus to the banks. Yeah, I so, agree. Uh, Tim has written, thank you for this talk, everyone. I once read in a piece by Darity that Americans support reparations for Japanese Americans interned in World War II which actually did happen, in, it did happen following the war in the Civil Liberties Act of 1988, significantly more than they support reparations for Black Americans for slavery and Jim Crow. I think this speaks to Salman's point that racism is programmed at the cognitive level. People can grasp the concept of reparations for people who have been harmed by injustice, but they cannot grasp the concept when it comes to Black Americans. The obvious question is how do we change minds and get individuals to understand when their cognitions are informed by racism. Right. Well, we all work to become anti-racists. I, I, I mean, there's, uh, I, I think that's what was um, the question that Isabel Wilkerson really was grappling with. I personally don't agree with the idea that racism is not an adequate construct to understand the United States and that we need another one called caste. Uh, but she was trying to figure out why is this so enduring? Um, and arguably it's economic, um, you know, benefit is, um, is, is not any longer the same as when you were getting uh, labor that was uncompensated. Um, so it is a good question. I don't really know the answer to it, but I, I do want to point out that things have gotten better. And I want people, I'm very happy that I was born when I was and not, you know, a century ago or 200 years ago, things have gotten better. And I made myself a promise because I spent a lot of time thinking about um, uh, racism directed at people of African descent, that I would always point out that the indigenous people of the Americas got the worst deal of all, that they're um, on, on every level. Uh, they, they were subject to genocide. What the colonial settlers wanted from the indigenous people was their land. And what had, and they, you know, were really 
subjected to genocide, but they survived. Um, and now they're paying a very high price in, in COVID mortality. Uh, so if I didn't point that out, it just is a final comment uh, that we should always remember um, that, that some, something needs to be done. Um, maybe like just acknowledge the many broken treaties that should be reinstated. So Mary and Jean, last, last uh, question for you, just as we wind down. You've shown us this incredible data about health disparity. We've, you know, you've tied it to economic disparity very well. Should we be fighting for reparations plus universal health coverage, plus free education, plus criminal justice reform? I realize it's a, it's a large thing to ask because people are already balking at just the financial reparations, but you know, all these questions around how do you change the hearts and minds? How do you get lasting change? Do we in some ways have to, it doesn't have to be simultaneous, but does the fight have to be that every one of those has to happen uh, in some short order to really have uh, some form of just society here? You know, the, I, I've heard from, this is, this is a, a delicate matter. You know, people that I would assume are progressive, you know, they, they come off as the sort of Bernie bros. Um, that's their argument, right? That we don't really need reparations if we get a Bernie that does health, you know, universal health care, uh, no student loans, yada, yada, yada. But when you bring it back to the people that are doing the, um, at least the uh, colleagues that are working on uh, reparations for uh, descendants of slaves in the US, they say, no, not at all. You, this post-racial fantasy cannot happen without the repair. You can't just shovel in this piecemeal stuff and think you're gonna get equity in that moment. You, re you have to repair the 400 years of injustice. The best way we think of is by reducing the wealth gap. Then we can move to this Obama post-racial society where also we're you know, becoming more socially democratic. So but should we be asking for all of them? Like should the ultimate well, I, I think so. Yeah, I mean, certain, uh, I, I really, I think that um, I, I'm more hopeful about reparations um, than, than I was, you know, I mean, I'm, I was a slower adopter, much slower adopter than, um, than uh, Sandy and Kirsten. But that I, I would have, I was, have been hoping that COVID would show how dangerous it is for all of us to have so many people who are working precarious jobs, living in overcrowded substandard housing, uh, who are um, you know, going to work sick because they don't have sick leave, uh, or don't have any kind of leave, uh, don't have health coverage so that their diabetes and high blood pressure and all the things that we call comorbidities are not well managed. Uh, would place them at higher risk of dying, that we would uh, figure out that we've got to fix this. Instead, I suspect we're going to be seeing the whole conversation switch to how do we, you know, deliver, manufacture, deliver, uh, dispense this vaccine, get people to take it, uh, when our vulnerability, as Jean has pointed out, was principally through exposure. And that our, if we don't change a single thing about the risk of exposure, whenever the next microbe emerges and they're coming around more frequently because of climate change and our destruction of the environment, we'll be just as vulnerable as we were this going on. So I that's think a, not a cheerful way to end. Well, I was going to say, Mary, on that <laughs> sobering note, you know, you, you, there's, there's hope with the reparations movement moving in the right direction. But on that sobering note, I think we, we all realize we have miles to go uh, before we sleep. So um, okay. anyway, let's end there. And, I, and thank you, uh, Professor Mary Bassett, Professor Jean Richardson, for such a rich discussion. We, we're very grateful. We wish everyone a very happy holiday. And we will regroup uh, after the new year. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you.